When we were there, I'm going to go give you a bit of a history now. When we were there, NASA, Colonel NASA, took over the Suez Canal. He nationalised it. British forces had been in Egypt up till 1956, but had left by mutual agreement. And as you know, the, the, the Suez Canal was jointly owned by the British and French. NASA decided to um, nationalise it and sure enough the British and French governments were up in arms and they colluded with the Israelis who didn't like the Egyptians and there was a task force was sent of what's going to be sent anyway everybody was up in arms and it was the same time there was this rebellion going on in Hungary so the whole of the, the you know the, the world was upside down the Americans of course hated the idea of the British and French going to invade Egypt um, and it was put off and put off anyway we went down the battalion went back to Dover and we were in 29th Infantry Brigade, that was three battalions, I can't remember, I think there was the uh, Royal West Kents and maybe the Royal, no, the York and Lancasters, I think were the others. We were told that we were going to be the first troops to go to Egypt after the Marines and the paratroops. Well, so we all went down to Salisbury Plain, lived under a canvas so that we would be near Southampton. A lot of reservists were called up to strengthen us. These were reservists. They didn't like the idea of joining the, the army again, but they were forced to. And we slept under canvas. It was a pretty miserable existence, I can tell you and these reservists didn't like it and some of them decided that they were going to make their own way home <laughs> so I remember that my company commander said to me one morning he said John what have you done with your troops or your soldiers <laughs> quite a few of them have left I said well quite honestly they're bored sir you know there's nothing to do here there's nothing worse than a bored soldier nothing worse he has to be occupied and there was nothing to do, but anyway, we got back to normal. And then suddenly we were told, right, all's off, go back to Dover. So we all went back to Dover. Then I think at the beginning of November 56, the balloon went up. The governments decided that they were going to invade Egypt. So once again, we got on a train at Dover to go to Southampton. I remember this train because it was very quick so we had to make provisions to get all our gear, our personal gear ready and we had to leave some of it at Dover, um, only take what we would need. We got on these trains, I remember this steam train took us up to um, London, went to Clapham Junction where we stopped and the WRVS came along with their train giving us cups of tea it was like those films that you see of people returning from Dunkirk you know anyway it was all kind of when we got down to, to, to Southampton and there was this ship called what was it called the New Australia it was a big liner and it was been used in those days, they, used to, they were encouraging emigrants to Australia, and you paid £10, and you got a trip to Australia and with a view to going and living in Australia. They were sort of people who were emigrating to go to Australia. Anyway, so we sat on board this ship all night, and I can say one thing. I think it was probably took a thousand at the most. I think we had about three thousand on it. 
There were troops sleeping in the bottom of the swimming pool. We had, uh, I remember my cabin, well, I didn't have a cabin, but there were four, there were two double bunks and a single bunk. We had officers in this, in the bunks, some sleep, I had to sleep on the floor because I was very junior, but it was um, pretty cramped. Then eventually off we sailed. We weren't told where we were going. We had a pretty shrewd idea. We were either going to Malta, Cyprus, or wherever. Uh, we weren't allowed to write home and tell all our mail was um, scrutinised, because we weren't allowed to say, Dear Mum, I'm off somewhere. Um, some, of the, some of the troops we couldn't... I mean, some of the soldiers were were quite interesting actually. Some of them couldn't read or write, or very little, so you had to write letters for them, um, particularly to girlfriends and things like that. And when they got letters, and you know, they would try and dis ask you to disguise where you were going, but you had to say no. Um, but anyway, we set sail, we passed Gibraltar, I remember this, and the the ship had to stop at Gibraltar because there was one soldier, I don't know which one it was ours, but um, one of our soldiers or not, one of the other regiments, because he had a bad, had to get off and have bad medical treatment. Um, but the Fusiliers were fine. Most of them came from the East End of London because that's where we recruited from. They were extremely funny. They had this marvellous Cockney sense of humour. Um, I, I really liked them and um, I got on well with them. We did, have, we did have one chap, I remember him, from Norfolk. Um, and he was known by the other Fusiliers, excuse my French, as that bloody mangle -wurzel. And he was always known as Wurzel. Um, but he, he got on very well. Anyway, let me continue. We got to... We then had to go to Malta because um, we didn't have enough water because there were so many troops on board, so we had to re put more provisions and water. And then we set sail. And I remember driving, uh, going out of Malta early one morning and the Grand Harbour there is a spectacular sight and I remember that distinctly with the sun coming up and us going out. As we got out of the harbour suddenly we saw two vessels, they were two destroyers coming to escort us to wherever we were going. We, by that time we gathered where we were going and eventually we arrived outside Port Said and it was a formidable sight. There were so many ships. There was, I remember there was a big French battleship called the Frigion Bar with its big 12-inch guns pointing towards them. And there was loads of ships. It was, I think it still is, the biggest expeditionary force that this country has done since Normandy or since the Second World War. It was certainly bigger than the Falkland Islands. Um, if you took the whole, the French and the British together. And it was a very impressive sign. Anyway, we landed... Sorry, let me just interrupt. Is this interesting or not? Oh, no, yeah, yeah. Is, is, am I doing... It's absolutely yeah. perfect. So, we arrived at Port Side. We got into landing craft and went ashore. And I remember the first place we went to was a building in Port Side which had been shelled. And we were told to go into this building and it was evening, so I got my platoon in there and sorted out. Went up the stairs and there was a couple of rooms and there was obviously a shell had gone through one side. I think it had been an old hospital or something. So we didn't bother about that. I can remember little incidents I can remember in the morning, I had a sort of uh, 
a bag where I kept all my toothpaste and you know washing bag and I hadn't done it up the night before properly I hadn't put the zip across it I opened it up in the morning and what came out of it but a whole nest for cockroaches <laughs> well you know cockroaches are not the nicest things <laughs> anyway this was what it was like and anyway, after a day or so my sergeant said to me sir there's a hell of a smell up upstairs so we went upstairs and in this room which are the shelves were, there were a couple of dead bodies they'd obviously been in this hospital when the shell had gone through it and they'd scarpered so I said to the sergeant right well get some Egyptians off the street sergeant and tell them to move the bodies and anyway so that was we did that um, or off the street it was very very there was a lot of um, poverty there and it was disgusting there were dead animals in the street and oh can't describe how it was. Anyway, we went on patrols there. Nothing really happened. Um, uh, we didn't get shot at because the Marines and the paratroopers had gone down the canal. They had gone down 26 miles to a canal station called El Cap um, where they were stopped because the United Nations there was a huge furor about this invasion um, because the f we went down one side of the canal the French went down from Port Fouad the other side of the canal and the, and the Israelis came through the Sinai Desert they were wanting to do the best they could to kick the Egyptians out anyway we um, after a few days we were told that we had to go and relieve the paratroops or the marines, I can't remember who it was down at El Cap so we all got into vehicles and went down to El Cap now the vehicle situation had been quite interesting when we had set off on this invasion um, all the regimental vehicles had to go down by didn't, couldn't go in our, our troop ship had to go down on other vessels and they hadn't arrived so we had no transport or so we had to get transport and then some of the transport was quite funny actually because there were a few showrooms in Port Side still left with some sort of American cars and I remember seeing one American car being driven straight through the glass window by a soldier and out onto the, um, the street. Oh, another interesting sort of you could understand how the Egyptians loathed us. There was, um, there, was, there was an airport at the side of Port Side called Gamal Airport. We had to go down there for some reason. I can't remember what it was. So I got in this three-tonner with some of my troops in the back and in front of me there was another vehicle going down there and you've seen pictures of these Arab women ca carrying with pictures on their, their, their carrying water in, and they carry them on their head, didn't they? And I couldn't believe this, this vehicle in front. Suddenly there were these two or three women walking along the side of the road. <laughs> Suddenly out of this thing a broom came out and <laughs> whisked these things across their head. I felt sorry for them, you know, but they were pretty ruthless sort of guys and of course they broke their jugs and everything. Well, anyway, 